All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. I think we're going to get started in just a moment as people trickle in. Um, it's my pleasure to have the FIDO Oracle team here today to talk about um, image analysis for plant phenotyping and high throughput phenotyping um, using containers and virtual machines in the cloud. Um, so it's really, really cool work. Um, what they've been doing is really focusing on less of managing your images locally, processing them locally, and putting them in an area that's publicly accessible and using uh, fair and open science principles in that. And so without further ado, I'll pass it along to Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. I guess we can start off with uh, a round of introductions. Travis, uh, do you want to go first? Sure. Hey everyone, my name is Travis Simmons. I, I'm an undergraduate biology major at the College of Coastal Georgia, as well as a data science research uh, specialist at uh, the Pauli Lab at the University of Arizona. And I mainly work uh, on the team as uh, doing 3D uh, phenotyping extractors, writing 3D phenotype extractors, as well as writing clustering algorithms and uh, working in the field as well. So it's nice to meet you guys. We're very excited for today. Hi everyone, I'm Emmanuel. I'm a third year PhD student in Dr. Duke Pauli's lab. My work mainly focuses on developing these distributed computing pipelines for phenotypic trait extraction, as well as doing field work. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share some links uh, in the chat here to our GitHub repository that we will be using today. So there is the repo. So if everyone can please click on that link and then just give us a thumbs up, letting us know that you are there. Okay, so now I will go ahead and start sharing my screen here. So this is the repo we will be using today. Uh, just a quick overview, we will be using uh, a Cybers VM or a virtual machine in order to process some phenomic data. Now, we usually process our data on cluster nodes through high performance computing or HPC resources. However, in order to make this more interactive today, we will be using virtual machines uh, and Jupyter notebooks so that we can actually see how those images are being analyzed and take a look at the actual numerical data. So if we scroll down here, we have some, uh, some descriptions of our pipelines, as well as the sensors that we process, as you can see here. And Travis will go into more detail. Uh, we also have some links to some of the tools that we use. But for now, we're going to go ahead and get started with our workshop preparation. So if we scroll down to workshop preparation, uh, you can see here a link to access our workshop. This is the one that you went ahead and registered for. So let's go ahead and click there, this blue here. And that'll bring up our Cybers user portal. Now, once we are at this Cybers user portal, let's go ahead and click on services and atmosphere right here. So I'm gonna take a, a quick pause. And then once everyone is able to access that, please give us a thumbs up and we can proceed. Okay, so it seems like we're getting a few thumbs up. So once we um, access the cyber uh, atmosphere portal, it's going to look something like this. This is what you should be seeing on your screen. So what we're then going to do is click on projects right above here. And then we're going to create a new project. And you can name this anything you want. Uh, for the purposes of remembering this workshop, you can name it Ag to Pi. And let's click on create. So for me, it's already uh, ready to go. So then once we're within this folder, we're going to click on new and instance. And I'll take a pause here just to make sure everyone uh, is there. 
<clears throat> and feel free to let us know if um, if anyone is having any problems accessing the repo or logging into their Cybers account. We have some support uh, uh, breakout rooms, so please feel free to join a breakout room. It is called support. Uh, and Arian Zaray, who is one of our other collaborators, is there uh, and able to help with any of these parts here. Okay. So once we are here, then we're going to click on show all. And we're going to click this Fido Oracle image here. And if you don't see it, if you just type in Fido Oracle, uh, it'll pop up here. So let's go ahead and click on Fido Oracle image. And once we click on it, it'll give us some options. And this is where we can uh, choose the resources for our virtual machine. So I'm going to take a quick second just to take a look at the messages to see if there's anything important. Okay. So Paul and Karan, am I saying that correctly? I apologize. Um, if you can join the support room uh, where Arian can help you out with that. It looks like they were able to join. Okay, perfect. So can I get a thumbs up from everyone else just to see if uh, we're okay to proceed? Okay, so Jeffrey, thumbs up. Antonio, thank you. Okay. So now that we're here, uh, let's go ahead and uh, select the settings that we'll be using today. So let's click on this base image version and select 2.0. Now this is setting the version of the actual image that we will be running today. And this has all the dependencies that we will need in order to process our data today. And then right uh, under instance size, we're going to choose something a little bit larger than this tiny one. So if we click on this drop down menu, let's go over to medium three. And again, that is medium three. Uh, CPU number equal to four, 32 gigs of memory, and 240 gigabytes of disk space. So we'll click there. And then lastly, we will go ahead and click on launch instance. Okay. So once you click on launch instance, you'll see uh, a loading indicator. And eventually, this uh, pop up menu will disappear. And you should see the Phenome Force Vital Oracle image uh, under a status of uh, deploying. Uh, so once you're at that point, go ahead and give us a thumbs up so that we know we can proceed. OK, so it's been a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to proceed with the uh, next few steps. If for whatever reason um, you guys aren't able to launch up your instances, please send a message. Uh, and Travis, please let me know um, if it seems like people aren't able uh, to get things running. So now we're going to hand it over to Travis Simmons, who is going to uh, give us a brief overview of the pipelines that we will be using today. Uh, these virtual machines will take some time uh, to actually load up. So in the meantime, Travis will give us presentation. Once we come back, those virtual machines should be up and running uh, under this active status. So without further ado, Travis, uh, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Emmanuel. 
Well, I hope everyone is getting up and running okay. I saw a few messages in the chat about uh, having some problems. And if you are, again, feel free to join that support room where Arian can help you out and get up and running. And to start out, I just wanted to welcome everyone and uh, say hello, nice to meet you. And to thank everyone at HE2PI for having us again. Today, we are going to be walking through workflows of two of our automated phenotype extraction pipelines contained in FIDA Oracle. FIDA Oracle is a, a scalable modular data processing pipeline for phenomic data that our team has developed. Before we get going, I did want to mention that this is our second time here at AG2, AG2PI. So if you'd like more information about our project, feel free to reach out or check out our previous presentation that Emmanuel will uh, link in the chat. So let's get started with some background. So around 6,000 years ago, the people of Mexico and Central America started domesticating teosinte by selectively breeding for desirable traits, setting the stage for modern corn. These traits could have been a whole host of things such as plant height and quantity or quality of yield. But back then these traits would have been measured by hand. But as times passed and sensor technology became more advanced, we can now collect both morphological and physiological phenotypes at scale. And we can also deploy these sensors in a variety of ways. Some of those ways include phenotyping carts, drones, satellites, and our platform that we use, the field scanalyzer. This, all this revolution gave rise to the field of phenomics. However, the vehicles with which we collect this data are not the only thing that has changed over the years. Advancements in genetics have also allowed us to understand that phenotypes are a function of not only genes and gene combinations, but the environment in which the plant is grown. This genotype by environment interaction that gives rise to phenotypes is what our team is interested in exploring, just as I'm sure many of you are. In order to do this, we use the field scanalyzer. The scanalyzer is equipped with five different sensors, each of which inform us about different phenotypes being expressed in our plants. Our first two sensors, we get very visual and morphological phenotypic data, such as with our 3D line scanner, where we have been able to gather plant height and volume measurements, and we hope to capture more traits such as leaf architecture. And then from our RGB sensor, we can extract bounding area and canopy cover. And the rest of these sensors are aimed at gathering physiological phenotypes. With our hyperspectral camera, we can analyze more than 900 bands per pixel and extract physiological data such as reflectance, uh, early disease detection, and water content. With our PS2 fluorescence sensor, we can quantify the plant's FV over FM, which is a measure of the plant's photosynthetic efficiency. And with our thermal sensor, we can measure an individual plant canopy temperature and thereby as water relations. So we can run these sensors and collect all this informative data about our phenotypes being expressed in our plants and inform the breeders about top performing lines. But our data is extremely bulky with the maximum amount of data per day coming in around 10 terabytes. And this is the real focus of this presentation. Because although not everyone is using a uh, field scanalyzer for their phenotyping research, this massive influx of data is a problem that we're all facing and we hope to address today by giving a demonstration of our novel system agnostic approach to handling this massive amount of data. Like I said, this field scanalyzer can output 10 terabytes of data a day and we needed a system that can take that data and process it in a manageable time frame for data, for data quality assurance and analytics. So we developed FIDA Oracle. FIDA Oracle is a suite of distributed computing pipelines for large scale automated phenotyping extraction. Here we see one of those pipelines in action. This is the workflow of our thermal pipeline. And this will be one of the ones that we'll be running later today. As you can see on the left, that you see these raw images, these small tiled images. These are from our field scanalyzer, but we can pretend these could be from a, a drone or any other georeferenced imaging uh, system. So you can feed a massive amount of incorrectly georeferenced images into this pipeline, and they'll be into, inputted into an algorithm by, that was developed by our team member, Arian, called Megastitch. Megastitch is able to take all of those images and output a georeferenced orth mosaic of the field, of your field. Then the image is clipped to the agricultural plot level. And finally, we leverage machine learning to identify individual plants and to extract numerical data about specific plants in that plot. Then it goes to the next plot and so on and so on until you have a giant CSV of actionable phenotypic data from your imaging platform. 
with each row of that CSV giving you biologically relevant data about the plants in your field. And again, I would like to reiterate that we have similar pipelines such as this thermal pipeline uh, for each of the sensor types I discussed earlier that we have on board the field scanalyzer. Earlier, I did mention that uh, Fido Oracle is a distributed computing pipeline suite. So let's take a second to talk about why the distributed aspect of the pipeline is so important. You can imagine that solving for the correct geocorrection of these, of those tiled images or cropping the ortho mosaic to each plot or running the machine algorithms for phenotype extraction as like hundreds of thousands of individual tasks, many of which can be done in parallel. The distributed part of Fido Oracle is that it splits all of those tasks up for you. So what does that mean? Well, as an example, here's our data flow map for our specific project. The field scanalyzer collects raw data, such as those tiled images you saw on the last slide. They are sent to a cache server where they are bundled up and then sent to the Cybers data store. Then we collect, then we connect to the uh, UA HPC, the University of Arizona High Performance Computing uh, Cluster, and then run an easy to execute command to launch one of the Fido Oracle uh, pipelines. Using a framework called WorkCube, Fido Oracle then launches what are called manager and worker nodes that you see on the right. The manager node looks at all those tasks we talked about earlier and uh, sends them off to worker nodes. The worker nodes complete those tasks and return the result. Those results are then aggregated and returned to the data store or sent to other scripts for further processing. And again, Fido Oracle can, Oracle can do this automatically for every, nearly every step in every pipeline that we have available. This allows for massive scaling of data, massive scaling of data processing along with the reduction in processing time. So let's take a look at how much of a difference the distributed computing approach makes. So if you had to guess, how much time do you think it would take to process a single season of RGB data, uh, which is around 50 terabytes big, uh, on a, a four core regular lab computer? Well, it would take around 55 years to go from the raw data that comes off of the scanalyzer or a drone or what have you, uh, to go to quantifiable phenotypes. Now with Fido Oracle on an HPC, uh, that same task that originally took 55 years to do only takes about six days. And this allows us to have responsive intra-season quality control to, of our sensors and our data, as well as produce meaningful data in a time frame that is useful for making breeding decisions. And with that, I'm going to hand you guys back over to Emmanuel to get started with the interactive portion of the workshop. All right, thank you so much, Travis. So for today's workshop, we will be processing some uh, thermal data and hyperspectral data. We will be collecting both thermal uh, temperature values for the canopy, as well as reflectance data uh, at the plot level. Now, as we go along, uh, please keep in mind that we have our GitHub repository, which I shared here. And within each one of these notebooks that we have, um, we have all of the outputs uh, on these notebooks. So if you get stuck at any point in time, you can always revert back to uh, this GitHub repo and scroll down to basically uh, keep uh, moving along with the workshop. You'll see all of the outputs that we're gonna be processing today, as well as the figures. So keep that in mind as we go along. Alternatively, we, I also want to remind you of that support room. If you're having any problems along the way, please do uh, join that support room and we will get you up and running. So for now, let's go ahead and go back to our um, Cybers uh, Atmosphere web page. And let's take a look at the status of our VM. You'll notice here that my VM is showing up as active. So for those of you that have an active VM, if you all could please give us a thumbs up to let us know that you're ready to proceed. Otherwise, we'll take a quick pause just to wait for some of those VMs to, uh, to start up. Okay, so we have one thumbs up, two thumbs up. Thank you, Jennifer and Paul. 
So it seems like we're going to have to wait for uh, just a little bit. So in the meantime, uh, if you all could please in the chat, uh, give us an idea of what type of data you work with, whether that be phenomic or genomic. We really are interested uh, in hearing what you all are doing. Uh, so please feel free to uh, either type it into the chat or if you guys want to unmute yourselves, uh, that would be awesome as well. Okay. And as you guys see that status uh, change to active, uh, please do let me know so that uh, I know when to proceed. I don't want to move along too fast. Uh, so at any time, uh, if you guys feel like I need to slow down, uh, please feel free to let us know. So it seems like we have some uh, responses here. So Jacob says that he processes um, UAV data. Awesome. We are also uh, we also process uh, our UAV data, both RGB thermal as well. And just keep in mind that even though uh, the pipelines that we are talking about today are de were developed for the field scanalyzer, you can also process UAV data. And it seems like Jennifer uh, processes livestock phenomic data. That's really awesome. And. Hafiz uh, works with phenotypic and genomic data for cows and bulls. So it seems like we have a few livestock people here. Welcome. And Claudia, UAV hyperspectral, RGB LIDAR, and Quran, RGB thermal and multispectral. Awesome. So I feel like some of you guys might have been interested by the uh, hyperspectral portion uh, of this uh, workshop. So welcome all. And we have another response, uh, multispectral and thermal imagery for pest and disease detection, really awesome. And it seems like for both agriculture and forestry, awesome. So it seems like we have quite a diverse uh, group of people here. Okay, so if you all could give me an update, uh, are we okay to proceed? If you guys in the chat uh, can just let me know okay or no, uh, I would really appreciate that. Still deploying, okay. Okay, Paolo, he works with uh, agricultural instrumentation, sensors, and biosensors. Nice. Okay, so it seems like uh, for most people, we are still building. So uh, as Travis mentioned, um, we work with the field scanalyzer, uh, which was uh, placed here in the university at the University of Arizona. Uh, and the field scanalyzer uh, has many sensors, which Travis showed a picture of. And the reason why it's really important uh, to have these uh, types of sensors here in the desert is because Arizona gets particularly hot. Right? So it seems like a lot of you guys use sensor technology, and it's really important and crucial, as Travis mentioned, to study some of these characteristics and phenotypes uh, really in, in extreme environments so that we know how the expression of these phenotypes change. And that's really one of the awesome things about working with this project. It's not particularly awesome in working in the field. It gets quite hot and humid, but we do get some really cool data that then allows us to uh, really leverage all of those sensors. Now, someone mentioned disease detection. Uh, there's also something that we are working on for our hyperspectral pipeline, uh, and we will be talking about somewhat briefly uh, during the workshop. Okay, so it seems like now for most people, we are networking, networking as a status, so okay. So Paolo, um, if you could go into the uh, support uh, breakout room, they'll be able to assist you with uh, setting up cybers. And for those of you that are having issues logging into cybers, um, you should have uh, registered for the workshop. So if you didn't register, that might be why you aren't able to log on to Cybers. So uh, if you go to that support breakout room, they'll be able to assist you with getting you set up. 
I'd like to mention just how cool it is that uh, all these different sensors are you know used in so many different ways in so many different fields. This so seeing all the responses is just it's exciting to be working with uh, the type of data that you know a bunch of different fields are using. It's a fun time. So we'll give a, a few more minutes here. Hey, Gerard. I if you uh, are having trouble getting it up and running, if you don't mind joining that uh, breakout room with Arian, he'll be able to get you set up. So for those of you that work uh, on UAV data, um, uh, it's, uh, I have a, a question. Do you guys usually extract plot level phenotypic information or do you guys do like individual uh, plant extraction? So any of you guys that uh, mentioned uh, UAVs, uh, if you guys could please respond, I'm, I'm curious. level okay awesome yeah so uh, what we'll be doing today is actually as Travis mentioned um, you saw briefly the workflow of our pipeline so one of the things that we've been working on very diligently is actually uh, developing many models uh, for diversity uh, of crops uh, we have detection models for lettuce sorghum uh, sunflower um, so one thing to keep in mind is that the pipelines that we are presenting here uh, can accommodate both individual plant phenotype extraction as well as uh, plot level. So we wanted to make this system as uh, user friendly and generalizable for most research groups. Um, so within our GitHub repo, we also have uh, contact information at the very bottom. We have an email address. So if you guys ever need to get a hold of us for any reason, um, please do reach out. We also have links to um, our distributed computing uh, repo as well. So if you guys are interested at, in uh, actually deploying our code uh, on many, many images, that's where you would go. And if you have any questions as you try uh, to do that, then uh, always feel free to reach out. Okay. So I just want to check back in on the status. So everyone who has an active status, if you can give me a thumbs up. Okay, so we have Jeffrey, Jacob. Paul, okay. okay. So for now, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We have quite a few people that are ready to go. Uh, additionally, we have, uh, some of the steps mentioned uh, in our, or not some, but all of the steps mentioned uh, and outlined in our GitHub repo. So we're going to go ahead and get started, uh, but also keep in mind that as we proceed, uh, if for whatever reason your VM is still taking uh, a little bit longer to build, keep in mind that all of the commands that I will be running in just a second are contained here. So even if it takes a little bit longer, you can catch up. And also remember that you can access the notebooks within our GitHub repo, and they will have all of the outputs ready for you to visualize. So you'll be able to follow along, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we can uh, proceed to uh, running our Jupyter Notebooks. So let's go over to our Atmosphere um, web page here. And you'll notice under the instance that we launched, um, there is an IP address here. We're going to go ahead and click on the Phenome Force Vital Oracle, and we're going to connect to that particular IP address. 
Now you can do this one of two ways. Uh, option number one, which is outlined in our documentation, is scrolling down to the bottom of this page and clicking on Open Web Shell. So if you click here, it'll bring up a terminal within your web browser. So this gives you access to the virtual machine, and you'll be able to run everything that we'll be running today. Alternatively, for those of you that are more comfortable with the uh, terminal, we can SSH into uh, our virtual machine. So in order to do that, I'll demonstrate that here. We would SSH uh, your Cybers username at and then the IP address. Okay, and I'll leave that up for a second and make that slightly larger. So again, that's SSH, your Cybers username at and then the IP address that is right in here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and connect. And it'll ask you for your uh, Cybers password. Just go ahead and type the same one that you used uh, to register for the workshop, and you should be in. Now, you'll notice here that it welcomes us to Atmosphere. Once you see this on your screen, you are ready to proceed. We are now connected to our virtual machine that is running our uh, imaged virtual machine with all the dependencies ready to go. So I would like to take a very quick um, break. If you guys can give me a thumbs up if you see this welcome to Atmosphere. Perfect. And just keep in mind, once again, for those of you that might have been in the breakout room, you can always access the outputs of what we will be processing within our GitHub repo. So please feel free to um, uh, take a look at that repo to follow along. Additionally, the commands are all listed here. So for whatever reason you get a little behind, uh, you'll be able to catch up. And also, this record this will be recorded. So this will be um, added on to the Active PI um, YouTube channel. All right, so now that we are connected to our virtual machine, we're going to go ahead and start copying some commands from our GitHub repo into our virtual machine. So the very first one is to clone our GitHub repository. So let's go ahead and hover over this command. And you'll notice this little clipboard. Let's go ahead and copy that and paste it into our terminal here. So you'll notice that it's cloning our GitHub repository and it's ready to go. So now you'll notice that my um, location here has changed from my home directory to my ag to pi workshop. So we are now ready to go. I'm gonna run a very simple LS just to show you guys what all is in this directory. So we have a Docker file. So we mentioned before that this workshop will uh, talk about container technology. Uh, here we have a Docker container that is going to be used to run a Jupyter notebook. Now we also have the notebooks that we will be visualizing, as well as the readme that you guys can follow along on. So now let's go ahead and process or run the second command here to download the phenomic data and our models. So let's go ahead and copy that command and paste it into our terminal. And this is going to go ahead and download some of the files that we need in order to run our Jupyter Notebooks. So in the meantime, I'm going to hand it back over to Travis, who will give us a little bit more information as to some of the other pieces of File Oracle that we don't have enough time to talk about today. So Travis, go ahead and uh, talk about that. Thank you, Emmanuel. And I just wanted to say that the uh, this would be a great time while I'm going through this step uh, for anyone who's got a little behind or needs some help to go to that uh, to go to that support room and get a little bit caught up while I'm going through this step. All right, let me share my screen. So the step that I'm going to be talking to you a little more about is called Mega Stitch. And as, as I uh, said earlier, Megastitch is an algorithm developed by Ari and Zaray, who's uh, in our support room right now, uh, but is a great computer scientist that we work with. So what Megastitch does is an orthomosaicing algorithm that Arian developed, uh, and it's able to take images from any geo-referenced imaging platform uh, and mosaic them together. Uh, in our case, the data that comes off of the uh, field scan analyzer looks something like the middle picture here. As you can see, they're not very well aligning. Uh, they're kind of skewed in different directions. 
Uh, and this is because the scanalyzer uses a relative coordinate system, has inconsistent delays in triggering, and sometimes skips images. This is, leads to a non-uniform staggering of all of our raw data, uh, making, and since it's inconsistent, it makes any kind of uh, consistent transformation to correct these images impossible. Um, however, we can feed it into Megastitch as part of one of our, any of our pipelines and get a clean full-field orthomosaic like you see on the right that we can then crop to the plot level, which you see in the middle there, uh, and be able to do our biological analysis, phenotypic analysis on uh, those cleanly orthomosaic pictures. And so the way that this algorithm works is by the use of GCPs, which are these uh, white bucket lids that you see on the right-hand side of the image here. We've gone out and taken hand uh, very accurate GPS coordinates of these uh, GCP lids or ground control point lids. Uh, and what we do is pin those GCP lids in their known location that we have from the uh, GPS points that we took. And then it goes through each of the, uh, the tiled images and solves for the best year correction possible around in the context of those GCP lids being known locations. And I, this is great because it uh, reduces, it fixes all that inconsistency that I was talking about uh, and allows us to get these clean orthomosaics. And a couple of other uh, issues with this uh, non-geocorrect, uh, non-georeferenced images, non-correctly georeferenced images, uh, is that with our project in particular, we have extremely uh, high resolution RGB images, uh, and we have around 10,000 of them per thing, per uh, field for full field orthomosaic we need to process. And uh, commercial available, uh, image stitching softwares uh, can't handle that amount of data at a time. Also, uh, the way that the scanalyzer takes these images, uh, there's very low app overlap between these tiled images with very few distinct visual features to be able to match those up like a, a, a regular orthomosaic and algorithm might need. It might need a high level of overlap to get distinct features in the two and then bring them together. I, yeah, so this allows us to have those accurate plot level orthos uh, so we can do any kind of analysis that we can further analysis we need to do. It also allows us to have uh, the, same, the same plant be in generally the same location on uh, all these different orthomosaics that we're producing throughout the season, which allows us to run clustering algorithms to uh, identify a singular plant and track it over time. This is useful for tracking growth, growth over time or differences in temperature over time. And then we are able to do uh, genotypic uh, uh, comparisons between different uh, agricultural plots in the field. So here's one of the results of a uh, just a portion of one of the fields. And as you can see, if you look closely on the left, all the small images are kind of slightly skewed in different directions. Uh, and then on the right, after putting them into Megastitch, they're very clean and a great worth of mosaic. So this step has allowed us to, it was kind of the first big step in allowing us to uh, then develop all these other phenotypic pipelines, uh, phenotypic extractors uh, for all the different sensors we have on the scanalyzer. So I just wanted to share that with you. And uh, in the notebook that we're gonna be running, uh, this portion has already been done. And we have a, a plot level uh, data for you that we're gonna be showing how the extractors work. So I just wanted to highlight this before we get into that. So uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Emmanuel, uh, and we can check in on how everyone's downloads are doing. Okay. So now we're going to take a, a quick pause just to let everyone get situated um, and give some more time for the download. So at the moment, what we're doing is actually downloading uh, our hyperspectral data, as well as the thermal data. Now, hyperspectral data is actually quite large in size. Um, so one tiny little image uh, is about 12 gigabytes. And this is because of the number of bands that it actually contains to actually give us the, the spectral signature that we're after here. So one of the things to keep in mind is uh, usually, we not only process individual images uh, at a time, it's basically multiple in, in series, in parallel. 
So it's also something important to note. In this particular case, we're only processing one at a time. Again, if you're interested in processing more, uh, we do have all that information in our documentation. So now it seems like we're still going with the downloads. So we'll give it some more time. Uh, and in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, uh, go ahead and post them into the chat or if you ha are having any problems whatsoever uh, with getting situated. Otherwise, we will start here shortly. And this would also be a, a great time uh, for any questions related to the presentation. So if anyone has them, any more questions about like the distributed computing portion, why we do it, uh, what the benefits are, uh, feel free to, to ask any questions as we wait. So we have uh, one question. I have used Docker a lot. What are the differences between Docker and Singularity? That is a great question. Um, so one of the major differences is that for Docker, you actually need pseudo privileges. And as you can probably imagine on larger clusters such as HPC systems or high performance computing systems at universities, um, that is not possible. So the alternative to Docker is therefore Singularity. It allows you to run containerized images without the need for pseudo privileges. And they are very similar in the sense that they contain all of your dependencies. Um, they are easy to deploy. Uh, it's just that major difference being the pseudo privileges. And the parts of the pipeline that we will be running today are basically taken from some of the containers that we have available publicly. So we'll be showing steps uh, that each one of those containers are running. So essentially, the way that our pipelines run is in, in sequence. And we have many containers chained almost like a link. And the images go from one to the next to the next to the next, so on and so forth. But the alternative to uh, just uh, running stuff iteratively is that we use this distributed computing uh, framework. So this allows us to then basically shuttle each one of those images through our singularity images uh, at the same time. So it's very useful. And then on top of that, right, both Docker and singularity share their uh, reproducibility or the ability to have higher reproducibility. Uh, since everything is self-contained within that image, um, there is little concern in terms of uh, whether or not something is reproducible if it's run on a container. So great question, Jacob. Yeah, one thing to add there is that uh, one thing I found really special about Singularity was that if you're used to doing commands like Docker build, Docker run just from uh, Docker Hub, uh, you can do the same thing with Singularity with almost no change in even syntax. You don't have to upload it to a different place or anything like that. You can just do Singularity build or Singularity run with the Docker uh, uh, path after that. And it just works exactly the same way, just without pseudo privileges. So it's a really helpful tool. Definitely. So how many of you here, uh, so I know Jacob has, how many uh, other people have used either Docker or Singularity? Just a thumbs up, just to get a sense for people's familiarity with it. All right, so far, okay, we have one. Perfect, so in the next step, what we'll actually be doing is running a Singularity container. Um, and that's gonna be uh, running a Jupyter notebook that contains all of the dependencies that we need. This includes all of the open source libraries uh, for processing both hyperspectral and thermal. Now, one of the important things about these, about phenomic data processing is not only the use of containers, but also the data management. Uh, so as you can see right now, we are currently waiting for data to be downloaded. 
This is also another uh, major thing that has to be considered in phenomic data processing pipelines. Now, as I mentioned, um, we usually run our pipelines on high performance computers and they provide a essentially a node specific to downloading. Uh, in this case, uh, we are downloading large files. So it's really important to not only think about the image analysis portion, but also the data management portion as well. So for those of you that are interested in a little more detail, uh, I have provided a link uh, to our previous ActiPy presentation where we do mention uh, data management as well. Uh, Emmanuel, maybe you could talk for a second about just what a container is like a general explanation of why would you use a container? Uh, you know, for least you mentioned reproducibility, but why would that make it more reproducible? Definitely. So one of the reasons uh, as to why using a container is preferred is because everything is self-contained, right? So I mentioned some of the open source libraries that we are going to be using today. Uh, those, those open source libraries can then be downloaded and not only downloaded, but a very specific version can be downloaded. Uh, within your Docker file. And that makes it very easy. And actually, as we um, wait here, I can bring up our um, Docker file just to show you guys uh, what that looks like. So I'm going to go into my scratch directory and into our ActiPy repo where our data is currently downloading. And what we're going to do here is go into our requirements.txt file. So within here, you can see um, that I have specified all of the dependencies for my code and also the versions of that particular uh, library. So this is what really makes it reproducible. Every time that you build this container, it'll always be built with H5Py 2.10.0 uh, and then all the other versions for these. Uh, so in that, it makes it reproducible because instead of handing someone your Python file, for example, now you hand them your Docker and your data, perhaps, and they're able to run it and get the exact same values that you got instead of them having to go in and you know, download all the dependencies. Okay. So for now, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and as that downloads. So can I get a, a status update for where everyone is at? Are you guys currently still downloading or are we ready to proceed? I just want to get a sense for where we're at. Okay. So in order to uh, move things along, what we'll do is go back to our atmosphere uh, web page. So we had uh, one terminal open where we're currently downloading our data. Uh, we will leave that one running. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll open up another uh, terminal here. So if we scroll back down and open up another web shell, we'll be able to connect to it. And then within here, I'm going to briefly walk you guys through uh, the files that we're downloading at the moment. So I mentioned uh, we're downloading our uh, thermal data as well as some of the other data sets that we'll be working with today. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look at those directories and see what they actually look like. So let's go ahead and take a look at the thermal data. So here we have an individual image for each plot within our field. So you'll notice that each one of these images are tagged by our specific plot number. Uh, so that's shown here. Uh, this is what our uh, FLIR data looks like. Now, keep in mind that this is an intermediate output. So this has gone through some uh, pre-processing steps. But in order to make things more interactive today, we have decided to uh, take these intermediates and basically uh, complete all of the uh, downstream processing so that you guys can see some of the outputs. Now, let's take a look at some of the other data here. So within our directory, we also have uh, these two model weights uh, files here. These are PyTorch models that are used for detecting uh, 
our panels within our hyperspectral data, as well as our uh, plants within our thermal data. So that's what these files here are. And then here, this uh, sample.h5 file is a hyperspectral file in the h5 format. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with h5, it is essentially a file format that allows for you to uh, include many data sets within it. So for example, if you're used to a regular TIFF file, that's only one image containing the numerical data for each pixel, and then also the metadata on top of that. However, with H5 files, you can actually add multiple data sets. So you can have multiple images within one H5 file. So for hyperspectral, it is really useful because it allows you to not only add multiple data sets, but also it allows you to easily compress your data uh, through a variety of different compression methods. Uh, these include like gzip, szip, and a few others. So let's take a look here. I'm going to briefly stop sharing my screen just to get a sense for where we're at. Okay. So as this uh, data is being downloaded, uh, one of the things that we can do is basically go in and take a look at the Jupyter Notebook so that we can see what the outputs look like. However, keep in mind that all of these outputs are going to be available. Uh, once this finishes downloading, you'll be able to run each one of these Jupyter Notebooks uh, even after the workshop is over. So for now, let's go ahead and start taking a look at some of these Jupyter Notebooks as our data processes, and then we'll come back to it and see uh, where we're at. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen here. So if we go back to our uh, GitHub repo, I'll go ahead and paste this in the chat again, just for those of you that were in a different room. We'll scroll up to our um, files here and click on Notebooks. So within Notebooks, uh, you'll see these different uh, notebooks so here we have the FLIR or thermal pipeline, as well as the HSI or hyperspectral imaging pipeline. So let's start off taking a brief look at the FLIR pipeline. So it'll just take some time to load. And here uh, we can see some of those open source libraries that I've been mentioning uh, uh, in the past. So for thermal, uh, we use GDAL, which is a geospatial library uh, written in both C and usable by Python. We also have this package called Detecto, which allows us to leverage uh, machine learning models, uh, specifically faster RCNN detection models. We also have things such as OpenCV, um, Pandas for data frame uh, management and access, and NumPy for array manipulations and stuff like that. So right after these import statements, we also have each one of the functions that we're going to be using today. So within here, we have uh, open image function, uh, get plot number, and it goes on and on. And each one of these are available for you to take a look at, to edit. Uh, and if you have any questions, as always, feel free to uh, let us know. So also, we have, last but not least, the detect plants uh, function here. So this takes an image. And it uses that model that I mentioned, our thermal object detection model, to identify every single plant within that particular image. So if we keep scrolling, now we'll actually uh, take a look at what we're uh, currently processing. So here we have an image list. So this is just going into a specific directory and getting a list of all of our images. So this image list is then fed in uh, right after loading the model. So here we're loading our model which is that uh, uh, PyTorch file, and we're detecting our plants. So now I want to go through a brief pipeline overview just to show you uh, what's actually happening and what this detection looks like. So sometimes with phenomic uh, data processing pipelines, it can seem a bit uh, foreign and a bit um, you know, difficult to understand. So here we have tried to make it as visual as possible to make it accessible to everyone. So first off, we start by plotting an image. Now this is one of our hyperspectral images and you can see here these black bands. Now these black bands are actually not uh, an issue with the image. They're just uh, no value pixels. 
And this is very important because uh, as those of you who use UAV data are aware of, we usually use things called shapefiles or GeoJSONs. Uh, so that's basically what this represents. In geographical coordinates, this area represents our agricultural plot. But for this particular image, we actually didn't collect data for this region of the field or this other region. And the reason for doing so is to actually make our thermal, um, our thermal scans faster. Uh, we usually want to keep them under two hours. And this is basically um, so that we can leverage as many biological insights as possible. We want to make it quick so that way the environmental conditions don't change as drastically, especially here in the Arizona heat. Uh, we go from about 90 degrees in the morning or so during the summer, and then it shoots up all the way to about 115. So we really want to make sure that we're significantly reducing the amount of time that it takes to actually collect uh, these scans in order to be able, in order to uh, get as many biological insights as possible. So now, uh, right after loading up that image, we then feed it into our model. Now, that image gets analyzed little by little, and from that, it then detects the plants. And as you can see here, we have uh, identified the plants that are labeled up here, or actually not labeled, but visual up there. So we can see these three plants, which are the same three plants that were above. And not only can we see the plants, but we can see the original image that has a color map, a pseudo color map, as well as the k-means clustered uh, mask. So what do I mean by that? So k-means is actually a clustering algorithm that allows you to effectively cluster however many uh, k or groups you have or want. And in our particular case, what we were uh, hoping to do was to cluster plant pixels and soil pixels separately into the, their own distinct clusters so that we could drop the soil pixels themselves because we weren't all too interested in those soil pixels. However, it is important sometimes to collect that data. So not only do we drop them, but we do store them momentarily just in case if users do have uh, some interest in the soil temperature at the time they can save a column that represents that particular uh, soil temperature as well. Now, after that brief overview, uh, we then iterate through more images. So here we went ahead and processed a total of five images. Uh, and after processing them, we can take a look at the actual output data. So here we're looking at a figure that represents the temperatures from this image here for different images, but representing the very similar uh, method that we took up here. So we can see on the x-axis, we have the plot numbers, which allows us to identify where we're at. And then on the y-axis, we have the median temperature in degrees Celsius. And you can see that there's some uh, variation. Uh, also, given that it's uh, thermal values, uh, there is quite a bit of uh, spread among these values. Now, um, it's also important to note that not only do we collect the median temperatures, but we also collect the standard deviations and a few other uh, statistics that are useful later on in your analysis of these phenomic data. One of the other uh, information that we collect is also the size of each individual plant. So if we scroll back up to look at these images, you can see that we have uh, that the model has output a bounding area around each individual plant. So what we can then do is calculate the bounding area of that plant. And that's what we're going to take a look at next in the second figure. So in this figure, what we're taking a look at right below here is the plant bounding area. So we can see the plot numbers similar to above. Uh, so these match what is shown above. And we can see the plant bounding area in meters squared and on our x-axis plots. And as we can see, uh, some of these plants that were a little bit cooler seem to be a little bit larger. So at least to my eye, there seems to be some, uh, potentially some correlation. So then the next step that you could take is to actually see whether or not there truly is a correlation. So what I've done here is basically uh, created a scatter plot where we uh, plot median temperature against the plant bounding area, and we get an R squared of 0.42. So in some sense, there is some minor, uh, very uh, low correlation between them. 
But these are just an example of the types of uh, analysis that you can do with your data. And also highlighting how in this particular use case, we've only processed five plots. However, with the use of these pipelines, you can process thousands uh, or hundreds of genotypes. Usually uh, in our particular use cases, we have about over a thousand plots, usually nearing 2000. And for the most part, we have hundreds of genotypes. So it's really uh, of interest to us and potentially to you guys as well to be able to make analysis, not only between genotypes, but also treatment zones and things of that nature. So in this particular case, we haven't plotted the treatment zones, but that's also one of the other things that you can do uh, with these types of data and our thermal pipeline. So before we move on to take a look at our data uh, download, I will take a quick pause just to see if there are any questions related to the thermal pipeline or if there are any comments as well. So I'll take a quick pause and feel free to unmute yourself or send us a message uh, in the chat. So it seems like there are no questions. If they come up, uh, please feel free to send them in the chat uh, as I talk and Travis uh, can let me know if there are any questions. So now uh, if we can go back to our web browser, just to take uh, a look. Emmanuel, mm -hmm. uh, we do have a question and it is uh, what ML model do you use to compute the bounding area? And I can also uh, show the labeling process if you would like. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead and show that labeling process. And then if you can briefly talk about the, the type of model as well. Yeah. Yeah, so we, in order to train models, uh, we leverage a site called uh, Labelbox which basically you can upload your images to whatever kind of images you have. Uh, and then you can hand label them using this really easy to use tool that's being shown here. Uh, you just go through and make a bounding area around the box and around whatever you're trying to identify. And you can have all kinds of different, right now we're just using this uh, label of negative, but you could have multiple different uh, objects that you're trying to detect. Uh, yeah, and then you can do this for thousands of images. You and your team can work collaborati collabor well, collaboratively uh, on this at the same time, and everyone can label their own images and get these projects done really fast. And then I, it'll output a, a, a label file uh, or a couple of files. And I, then we use a Detecto uh, Faster RCNN uh, network, which is a, a object detection network uh, that was recently developed that is extremely easy to use. And that's Detecto, uh, D-E-C-T, D Detecto. Yeah, you can spell it. Uh, but uh, if you, Emmanuel, if you would maybe put the uh, link to the documentation uh, for that. Uh, it's a great uh, network and uh, tool to use. Uh, definitely the easiest object detector that I've used before, easy to train and uh, really clear documentation on how to set up your uh, training data and everything. Okay. And are there any other questions before we move on? Uh, if you all could please take a look at your browser uh, and let me know whether or not your uh, data download is ready to go. So just give me a thumbs up. Okay, so Jacob, you are ready to go. Anyone else? Okay, we got about three people. Awesome. Four. All right, so we can continue moving forward. So now let's go ahead and, so in your terminal, it should be, um, uh, Travis, since I'm gonna start up, can you um, share that link to Detecto? Perfect, awesome. All right, so now let's get going. So let's go back to our terminal here. And for you guys, it might look slightly different if you're using the, uh, the web shell. So now once we have the data uh, completed uh, and ready to go, we can take a look at our directory. And you'll notice all of these files are ready to go. 
So the next command that we're going to be running is, I'll bring up the documentation once more. We'll scroll down to about the center of it, and it'll be this launch the Jupyter notebook command. So we're going to go ahead and hover over this command and copy and paste into our terminal. Okay, so this uh, is currently running a singularity image that is going to be accessible to us via our web browser. So here uh, you'll notice, for those of you that are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, uh, the usual output here, which is uh, setting up a server, and then it gives you this um, IP address that you can access or URL. So what we're going to do, uh, and this is listed in our documentation as well, um, go ahead and copy this link here that starts with VM. This will give us access to our Jupyter Notebook. So I'll show you guys here what that looks like. So it'll be this link right here that starts in my scenario with VM 142-6. For you, it'll be slightly different numbers, but it'll look something similar to this. So we can then copy that. And we can momentarily minimize our terminal and just paste that into a web browser. And what you'll see here is a Jupyter notebook that is starting up. And if for whatever reason uh, it asks you for a password, uh, we have set that password to password. Um, so that's listed within our documentation as well. Uh, so that should give you access into the Jupyter Notebook. So before we proceed, um, please give me a thumbs up, letting me know uh, if you were able to bring that up. Okay, Kalalia, you're ready to go, perfect. Jacob, awesome. Okay. Quentin, thank you. Okay, so now let's uh, proceed. So within this uh, folder, you'll notice the our notebooks folder. So go ahead and click on notebooks. And we'll go ahead and then click on the FLIR uh, thermal pipeline. So let me make this slightly larger here, just so everyone can see. All right, so we'll click on this one here, and that'll bring up the notebook that we were uh, just discussing not long ago. So for now, uh, just to give you guys uh, hands on, let's go ahead and actually run this. So in order to run a um, Jupyter notebook, you have to click on shift enter. So if we do shift enter, you'll notice uh, that it'll actually run this cell. So it'll import our libraries. Okay, so that has completed. And then now we'll run this cell with all of the functions that I had talked about previously. So let's go ahead and run those. And then let's take a look at our image list. So you guys don't have to do this, but I'll just show you guys uh, what this list represents. So it represents all of the images that are contained within our data directory that we just finished downloading. Now, you can also print the length of that. I believe it's about 13 images that we're going to be processing here. Yep, perfect. OK, so then now we'll go ahead and load up our model. So uh, again, this is a faster RCNN detection model. And we'll continue pressing Shift Enter. And here we'll show you, uh, very similar to before, the detection of plants on a single image. So here you can see the original image, and here you can see the actual outputs. So we see plant number one, uh, here's the plant, uh, the soil, and the segmentation of that. Okay, and we also see the temperatures for these plants. You'll notice that this particular plant is uh, registering as 41 degrees Celsius, and the second one is 39 degrees Celsius. Uh, yes, it is very hot here in Arizona. Uh, as I mentioned, sometimes in the summer, it can get up to 115, if not more. Uh, so that just shows you, for one individual image, how we can detect each individual plant and isolate it from the larger image. Now, once we have this plant isolated, we can then cluster it. And then this cluster can then be used to average out those pixels that are uh, clustered as being a plant 
And then we can fill in our data frame and save that as a CSV for downstream analysis. So let's go ahead and continue running our Jupyter Notebook. So let's go ahead and run this cell and we're just going to process, iterate through each one of these. Now, for this particular case, um, we can iterate through these images, no problem. But usually we are dealing with on the order of 9,000 images. So that's really why distributed computing is so important uh, to what we do. So we'll take a look at that. And we will take a look at the output. So here we're looking at our plots, our median temperature. And similar to before, here we're taking a look at the plant bounding area in meters squared and the plot. So we can compare the two and take a look at what those look like. And alternatively, we can run a much larger scatter plot to the one that I saw before. And you can see that in this case, once we add more data, uh, that correlation dropped. Now we're at about 0.16. There seems to be, at least in our data set, no particular uh, correlation, or at least not strong correlation, between uh, these two um, phenotypes. However, uh, I'd also like to show you guys what that final data frame looks like, uh, just to give you guys a sense of how you go from an image here all the way down to a data frame that contains all of your phenotypic information. So here you can see that we have uh, three plants under plot 0404. We see the median temperature, the mean temperature, the standard deviation, and also our area in meters squared. Okay, so that shows you uh, firsthand and hands-on how we process all of our data within uh, Fido Oracle. So again, this is our thermal pipeline. It allows you to extract data on multiple plots at the same time through the use of distributed computing. Although today we're showing it on a Jupyter notebook in order to make it more hands-on. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and click on our folder and go to the second notebook that is contained within our directory. It'll be named ag to pi HSI pipeline. So if we click there, we'll notice uh, a second notebook pop up. So I'll take a quick pause here uh, just to see whether or not anyone needs uh, to take a small break if they need to catch up. So Claudia, the reason why you might be getting slightly different results in the uh, overview is because the order of those images actually changes. So it'll load up a random image for each one of you guys every time that you run that overview. So it'll look slightly different. But the data set itself, uh, if I share my screen again here, uh, will look similar here. So here's our thermal pipeline. If we scroll back down uh, here, this is where you might see a slightly different output than me. Uh, that's because we load a random image just for visualization purposes and to go through the overview. And then here, we should get very similar values. Um, so if you take a look at that, you might see that uh, that's lining up. And you can also uh, compare it to, um, or sorry, the one on our GitHub repo is slightly different. That was with a smaller data set. So it will look different if you're looking at the GitHub repository. So here we went ahead and added more images just to give you guys an idea of the scale that we can process at. So the stat, great question. Um, Jacob, the standard deviation is across the uh, plant. So we basically average the pixels that were uh, identified as being plant pixels. And then we calculate the median and the mean for that and the standard deviation as well. Does that answer your question? Any other questions before we proceed with the second uh, notebook? Do we need to create our own models depending on the plant we study? Great question, Quentin. Um, so the answer is, it depends. We have uh, some models that you can leverage uh, in your image data sets. 
Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, we have sorghum, lettuce, and we're currently working on sunflower as well. So if you grow any of those crops, you can leverage the models that we have for each one of those uh, crops. However, uh, if you grow something slightly different, um, you can build up your own model. So we can show you the document. Uh, I believe Travis shared the documentation to Detecto, which shows you uh, basically from start to finish, how do you actually uh, label your images and eventually train on them? And if you are more interested in uh, getting a sense for how uh, we did it, uh, feel free to send us an email and we can send you uh, some of the code that we used uh, to basically train a model. Alternatively, what I can do for you guys is place that code into our GitHub repo. So if you guys do a git pull after this workshop, you'll see a new Python script and you can take a look at that. Perfect. All right, so now let's go ahead and proceed uh, with the uh, next steps of the pipeline. And I just wanna get a sense for um, how everyone is doing. Is everyone good? Give me a thumbs up to proceed. Perfect. All right. So now let's go ahead and take a look at this hyperspectral uh, pipeline now. So very similar to our actually, First, I have to share my screen. <laughs> I'll zoom. OK, so now here uh, we can see that it's very similar to the uh, thermal pipeline. So similar to before, we are importing all of our uh, libraries that we will be using today. These include things such as Spectral Python, which is an open source uh, hyperspectral processing uh, library. Also H5Pi. Uh, we also have um, CV2, very similar to before. Uh, and also Detecto that we've mentioned uh, previously. So all of these are going to be loaded up. So let's go ahead and type in shift enter. And it's going to go ahead, load up all of our libraries. And then we'll do the same thing for our functions. So let's just go ahead and run that cell. And then similar to before, we're going to be loading up a model. This is a slightly different model than the one that we use to detect sorghum, but they were trained almost exactly the same. Different images, but similar to the GIF that uh, Travis shared, it was basically uh, trained by labeling images, training based on those labels, and then you get a PyTorch model, uh, which you can then leverage on either within a Jupyter notebook, as we're doing here, or on a high-performance computing cluster if you so wish to do so. Uh, for more information, always look at our documentation, and you can see how we deploy these models on either of those systems. Now here, as I mentioned, we're going to open up our model path, and we're also going to open up our, um, our hyperspectral file. So let's go ahead and run this cell, and also take a look at the hyperspectral image itself. Now, for those of you that are familiar with hyperspectral or multispectral, uh, you are probably aware that these images contain many bands. So it is actually quite difficult to work with. So here, instead of actually displaying all of the hyperspectral bands, I'm only displaying the 700th band. This is uh, to ensure that we can actually process this uh, and visualize it uh, in an adequate amount of time. So now here you can see what that hyperspectral image looks like. So here, if I zoom in a little bit more, you can see all of our plots within the field. And again, this is only the 700th uh, band, but we can see uh, all of the plants contained uh, within here. So we're going to go ahead and then run the uh, next step. So here, we're going to take a look at our wavelength floats. So if we take a look at this, this just represents the uh, wavelength value in nanometers for each of our um, bands. So here I'm going to print out the very first one, and then also right underneath that, the very last one. If I can remember which band that is. Let's take a look at 900. So we, uh, our hyperspectral data is collected uh, in very small intervals, and it ranges from about 400 nanometers to 1,000. Now, this is a head wall veneer system, 
And just to show you guys how many uh, bands we are working with here, uh, it's going to get a little messy here, but let's go ahead and take a look. So you can see each one of these are the bands that we're going to be taking a look at today. So our resolution here is at about 0.6 of a nanometer from one band to the next. So it's really high resolution, meaning that we get a lot of information uh, from these data. All right, so now I'm gonna go back to the original uh, cell and we're gonna go ahead and run that. And just to keep in mind, um, this step here might take a little while. So what we're doing here is we are converting uh, this hyperspectral data cube into a pseudo RGB image. Now, thankfully, we added all of the outputs to our notebooks. So this is what that image will look like. So we're taking all of that spectral information and we are then synthesizing essentially a RGB image that is representative of that hyperspectral file. And the reason for doing this is so that you can then leverage um, machine learning applications such as our object detection. So what we do here is we generate this RGB file. We then run our uh, panel detection to detect our panels here. And then if you notice here, we can see a panel contained within the image. So that panel is actually a reference panel that contains four different steps. Those four steps range in reflectance uh, percentage, but the one that we're really after here is that white band there. That white band is the 99% reflectance that we can then use to calculate our reflectance. So in the meantime, while that's going, I would like to go back to our GitHub repo as that processes and just briefly talk through uh, what we're doing with each one of these data sets. So we just talked about thermal or FLIR. And within this data set, what we're really after is the canopy temperature. This allows us to understand the water relations between the plants. And within a very, very hot state, such as Arizona, uh, it's quite interesting to take a look at that data and see how those plants are uh, thermal regulating. Now, that information is also combined with the RGB information. So we get plant locations from our RGB uh, data sets. We get canopy temperature for our thermal data sets, as well as canopy temperature depression. And canopy temperature depression is basically the difference between the atmospheric temperature and the plant uh, temperature, whether that be a leaf or the canopy. Now, one of the other data sets that we didn't take a look at today was uh, PS2, which is a chlorophyll fluorescence uh, sensor. And I believe someone uh, mentioned it in the chat. So this uh, particular sensor gives us what's known as FV over FM, which is known as the photosynthetic uh, efficiency or photochemical quantum efficiency. And this value not only allows you to understand how many electrons are being pushed through uh, photosynthesis, but also whether or not a plant is stressed. So this is one of the first indicators. And then on top of that, we also have a scanner, uh, a 3D laser scanner, which gives us a 3D reconstruction of plants. And this data set gives us more of a morphological uh, insight into our plants. We can detect, or sorry, we can calculate plant height, leaf angles, leaf widths, all of those things. So together with RGB, these represent our morphological data sets. Now at the moment, we are currently processing our hyperspectral data. Now with hyperspectral data, you can calculate, you can uh, determine many things, one of which is reflectance. You can also do things such as disease detection, which was also mentioned uh, in the chat. So one of the interesting uh, projects that we have going at the moment is being able to detect um, a disease known as dry rot in our field. So sorghum in our field is susceptible to dry rot, which is a fungal disease that affects the roots of plants. That infection or disease travels up to the tips of the leaves and it causes uh, gray coloration. And not only a difference in color, but also curling of the leaves. So it becomes really prominent in our RGB images. However, what we're interested in understanding is early disease detection, as I'm sure some of you are also working on. 
So not only are we interested in detecting them at the onset of, of symptoms, but also before. And with hyperspectral, you can do that uh, because all of that uh, spectral signature is likely to change when disease affects plant. It causes changes in the plant cell, which are then going to lead to changes in the reflectance pattern of those plants. So it is through that hyperspectral data that you can then begin to detect diseases early on and also validate them using the stereo RGB pipeline. And this is really where geospatial coordinates become very important because once we detect dry rot in a particular plant, we wanna make sure that our hyperspectral data is co-registered so that we can go back to the same plant within our hyperspectral data and then make that assessment as to whether or not dry rot was identified in RGB. So if there are any questions or any comments about that, uh, please feel free to let us know in the chat while we wait for this step to finish. So I'm gonna take a look at the chat real quick here. And Travis, do you have anything else to add to the uh, to what I just mentioned in the overview of our data sets? Uh, to me, one of the things that we could touch on would be the uh, the 3D. Uh, it's just such a such a fun visual data set. I um, I know you mentioned a little bit, but uh, being able to look at those, visualize those uh, leaf traits, and just being able to kind of look around those full field point I mean, uh, full pass point clouds is a is a really interesting, insightful thing to be able to do. Definitely. And do you guys have any comments, the audience? Um, how do you process? So many of you um, mentioned working with multispectral and hyperspectral. Um, how do you guys process the data? Do you guys see a bottleneck when you guys do process your data? Okay, so while we wait, uh, given the time, we can briefly walk through the other steps and just keep in mind that since you already have the data and you already have the Jupyter notebooks, you'll be able to run uh, each one of these pipelines at your leisure. Uh, the workshop itself will continue to be available for uh, some time. So uh, feel free to uh, continue running these pipelines as you wish. And if you have any questions, let us know. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and walk us through the, um, the rest of this hyperspectral pipeline because um, one of the things the hyperspectral poses, right, is a large file size. Even if you bring down the image file size, um, it's still quite difficult to work with. And right now we are working on a four, uh, a, a virtual machine with four CPUs um, so it really creates a bottleneck. So this here highlights the reason for distributed computing. So now let's go ahead and take a look at what we output here. So one of the things that we're after, after we generate the RGB is being able to detect those uh, reference panels that I mentioned. So we can see it here in the image. We run our detection model and that detection model outputs the location of that panel. So you can see the panel contained here and not only the panel contained, but also clustered into different groups. Now it is this cluster here that we are interested in. So we go ahead and pull that information. And now we can visualize what that looks like. And that's the figure presented here. So here we're looking at the reference panel spectral signature. And here we're looking at the wavelength and nanometers on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we're looking at digital numbers. So our instrument collects uh, the intensity uh, in a unit known as digital numbers. And so is our, our, the data that we saw above. So through the use of this reflectance panel, we can then calculate uh, our percent reflectance. 
So after we have identified the exact location of that panel and pulled out the spectra, we can then uh, uh, apply an NDVI mask to the image as a whole. In this case, we're only uh, focusing in on one particular plot. And as you can see here, that NDVI mask allows us to drop soil pixels and only keep the plant pixels, as you can see here. So the soil is blacked out. Uh, those pixels that were identified to be under a specific NDVI threshold uh, were set equal to an NA value so that they're not analyzed here. Now, soon after that, we then run a k-means algorithm. So again, k-means allows us to cluster uh, pixels into various groups. And once we do that, we get this output. Now, this output represents three different clusters. Cluster number one is black. That black cluster represents our soil. Cluster number two is gray, and that gray cluster represents our shaded pixels. And cluster number three is white, which represents uh, our sunlit pixels. So after that, we can then calculate the reflectance given the spectral signature of our panels and given the um, soil shaded and sunlit pixels of our array. So after that, we can then calculate our reflectance. And that's what you're looking at here. Here on the y-axis, we're looking at percent reflectance. And on the x-axis, we're looking at the wavelength and nanometers. And here we can see that sunlit and shaded pixels are shown in different colors, shaded in blue, sunlit in orange. Now, the reason for this difference uh, is the lighting conditions, right? Since some of them are sunlit, others are shaded, they're going to have different uh, reflectance patterns. So it's really important to be able to cluster those pixels into distinct groups so that you can do your analysis separately on each one of those pixels, because they may be telling you some different uh, biological insights. Now, I'd like to give a brief overview of what we just went through, um, just to kind of recap and show um, what was done here. So we started off by opening up our hyperspectral image array. We generated an RGB image from that hyperspectral. We then deployed a detection model, which is a faster RCNN detection model to detect the panels within our hyperspectral data. We took that information to clip out the panel from our hypercube, and then we clustered that data. We extracted the white reference step, which we then plotted. And then we went ahead and segmented our pixels into sunlit, shaded, and soil. Now, after all of that, we then get our percent reflectance. And here, one of the things that we have shown is it takes quite a bit of time. This RGB conversion is still running, and it's been quite a bit of time uh, since we started it. So because of that, it's really important that we use parallel computing through the use of distributed computing, particularly with data sets that are large, such as hyperspectral and scanner 3D data as well. Through the use of that distributed computing, you can take uh, a, a pipeline that would otherwise take days into hours, because instead of running it one at a time, you're now distributing those tasks through the use of distributed frameworks. So before we end, I would like to hand it back over to Travis, who will close uh, with some closing remarks. And I would like to thank everyone for following through this workshop. I hope it was uh, of interest to you all, and I hope that you guys were not uh, lost. We try to provide support. So please let us know if you have any questions. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, information as to contact within our GitHub repository. So always feel free to reach out. So Travis, take it away. Hello everyone again. Uh, again, thank you guys for uh, coming. That was a great time and thank you for HE2PI for having us. Uh, here I have some uh, resources for you guys. Uh, if you guys wanted to take a screenshot of those uh, to check out later, it's the documentation, containers, and workflows, where you can find our open source data, uh, where you can visualize our ortho mosaics that I was talking about, and an interactive ArcGIS map uh, to explore the data yourself. And also, as uh, Ryan had put in the chat, this will be recorded and put on AG2PI's website, as well as on YouTube. So you'll be able to uh, find these links there as well. 
And we just wanted to close by again, thanking the HHPPI team for having us. We'd also like to thank the cyber staff for the IRODs and virtual machine troubleshooting to get this whole workshop up and running. They were super helpful. And also we'd finally like to thank uh, Dr. Duke Pauli, Cobus Bernard, and Eric Lyons for their support and leadership uh, of our team. And we think you like to thank all you guys also for coming and participating. And we hope you guys have an awesome rest of your day.